the Children's National Hospital and University of Maryland Black Alumni Network member. In conversation with Dr. Nora Arnold, Doctor of Physical Therapy and Adjunct Professor of Women's Health at Johns Hopkins, as well as Dr. Mariana Falconier, Associate Professor in the Department of Family Science and founder of the Evidence-Based Program Together, an interdisciplinary group program designed to help couples improve their communication, coping, and financial management skills. Thank you all for volunteering your time to be here this evening. Without your expertise and generosity, programming like tonight's event would not be possible. My fabulous board colleagues, Tina Wenzla, Class of 2012, Behavioral and Community Health, and Rovina Manor, Class of 1998, Kinesiology, will facilitate tonight's conversation. To the entire Terrapin Perspective Spring 2023 Planning Committee and the UMD faculty and staff who have made this evening's event possible, in addition to our partner, the University of Maryland Black Alumni Network, our sincere thanks for your partnership and assistance. Attendees are welcome to submit questions for our panelists in the chat during the discussion for our question and answer session at the end, and this event will be recorded. Now I will turn over our discussion to our panelists for them to introduce themselves and tell us more about their incredibly important work. Angela, over to you. Thank you so much, Jameson. I'm so glad to be a part of the discussion today. So yes, I'm Angela Bodu, a um, clinical dietitian at Children's National Hospital. Um, I work there currently as the clinical nutrition manager overseeing the dietetic uh, program and the dietitians, the 30 of them, that are at the hospital managing the nutrition of the patients, both inpatient and outpatient. Prior to becoming the manager, I was cl uh, a clinician seeing patients um, outpatient, my specialty area being weight management, also in diabetes, heart health, and uh, fatty liver disease. Those are my areas that I, I specialized in. Um, now that I'm in management, definitely still wanting to um, have these opportunities to talk to um, patients, to talk to individuals and provide what I can in terms of medical nutrition therapy and in counseling. So again, very happy to be here. I am a UMD alum, class of 09. Um, so very happy to be um, part of this and discuss what I think is really important with, with women's health. Um, being at a children's hospital, of course, you know, my patients are the little ones all the way up until age 22, however. So we're talking to our, our young girls, our adolescents and teens. Um, we're also talking to the parents, our moms, um, when we are having the discussions about how to preserve our health through our nutrition, what nourishes our body. So a huge passion of mine that I've had for over a decade now, I've been doing this, um, started in the WIC program, um, and then now at Children's Hospital. So again, very happy to be here and have this discussion. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nora Arnold. I'm um, uh, also a UMD alum. I have my bachelor's from University of Maryland in history. Um, and that's, uh, I got that in 2014. And then I went on to get my doctorate in physical therapy at George Washington University. And I'm super excited to be here today because I think pelvic health is so important to women's health, um, specifically everybody's health, but especially women's health. Um, and it's an area that, you know, isn't quite as well known. And so my work currently, I'm at Johns Hopkins. Um, as mentioned before, I'm a pelvic and women's health physical therapist. I'm in clinic. I also serve on the faculty for the residency here, as well as an adjunct professor role at GW's PT program, curating their pelvic and women's health content. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to, to hopefully clarify what pelvic floors are. <laughs> So uh, I'm Mariana Falconier, very excited to be here. And uh, I really thank the invitation to be sharing the, the panel today with Nora and Angela and with all the alumni from the University of Maryland. I'm, uh, I speak with an accent because I'm from Argentina and I came here in 1999 together with my husband to study both of us at the University of Maryland. Um, we got a wonderful education. First we got our, I, I was bringing um, a degree in psychology and here I got my master's in Kaplan Family Therapy. And um, in 2004, I got my doctoral degree in family science. 
Um, after that, I worked uh, for a while. Um, I, I continue working as a therapist, a uh, couple and family therapist, and also as a directing clinic in, you know, the public sector and in the, um, and also, you know, um, state funded. And, uh, and later on, I joined academia at Virginia Tech. I did a, my, the tenure track career there. Uh, and then in 2019, I came back here to the University of Maryland um, and in both at Virginia Tech and here I've been an associate professor and director of the Kaplan Family Therapy Master's Program. And um, a lot of what I did here uh, as my dissertation uh, at the University of Maryland, which was on how uh, couples were affected by the economic crisis uh, that my country at that time was going through, that shaped a lot of my career later on. I, I learned how important it was for uh, couples to um, have a healthy relationship, a stable relationship, how much that affected the um, well being, physical and mental well-being of each of the partners, and uh, of course how that had an impact on the children and the relationship with friends and other family members and at work as well. So learning about the importance of uh, having healthy intimate relationships was something that came out directly from my dissertation work that I carry with me then in my work as a therapist. And that later on, as I will talk later, helped me design the um, TOGETHER program. And uh, one of the things that I think we were also asked to, to share with you is like if there was something that perhaps uh, a habit, a health belief or behavior that you know improved our lives in some way, and to me, it's related to uh, my journey as an immigrant. When I was in Argentina, I, I only knew that I wanted to, to learn more about how to do couple and family therapy. And I know that I would learn it here in the United States and that the University of Maryland was one of the best places to, to learn about that. But I didn't know I had no idea of all the opportunities that I could find um, in this country and in this university. So I think that uh, all along the way in these last 20 years, one of the things, 24 years that I've been here, one of the things I've learned is like to really um, remain open and have a sort of open learning mind all the time and really um, not being uh, fixated in perhaps one goal and one way to go about things, but really, being open to learn about new ways of doing things and new paths that I have not thought about or dream about. Uh, I feel that today reality is way better than what I thought it would be uh, professionally. And I think I'm um, deeply thankful for that. So let's see. Thank you so much, Mariana. Uh, what a wonderful segue into our discussion today. So thank you everybody for being here. What an honor it is to be moderating this important discussion with my fantastic uh, panelists and my colleague Provina. Really couldn't ask for a better way to spend our evening. We've already started with so much passion. You can hear it in their voices. Um, this is going to be an open discussion with questions directed to the panelists, but they're going you're going to see the intersectionality between their work as it relates to women's health. So I think we can go ahead and probably get started. Um, so the first topic, hence passion, you, you drove right into it. So as women flow through the many changes and stages of life, I think it's important that we continue to support our colleagues, our friends and family as they embark their respective health and wellness journeys. Each of our panelists today, as you've already heard, have a story that exemplifies how they're thriving in their current stage of life. And it really all starts with that passion and understanding your why. So thank you, Mariana, for that beautiful, beautiful segue. Um, so we're gonna talk about what truly drives their, their current passion, their career, and really how they're, how they're living it through today. So um, Angela, I'm gonna start with you. So um, you work as a dietitian at Children's Hospital. Curious, what do you enjoy most about your experience as a dietitian? How has your work evolved? And you know, what do you find most difficult these days? There are there are some days and there are some difficulties. <laughs> um, it's not all not all rainbows and sunshine, but um, would love to hear your perspective. Yeah, well, uh, it's uh, the simple answer is I love food. Uh, <laughs> that you can probably ask most dietitians. Why do you want to talk about food all day? Because I love it. And this is the, the profession where you can do that. <laughs> so initially, my first interest came when I was 10 years old. 
um, my dad was diagnosed with type two diabetes and things in the house began to change. Like we weren't having as many sweets around and we weren't, you know, there was conversations about dad needs to like not eat as much starchy foods. And there was just a lot of that. And I said, I don't understand. There's medicine, like just take medicine. <laughs> and then that be the end of it. Um, and not so much knowing how impactful what we ate and what we put in our bodies changed the trajectory of our health and could help prevent and even treat, you know, the conditions that we have. So that's when it first piqued my interest. And uh, my family's from Ghana. So in our food traditionally is pretty high starch. <laughs> um, and so that was a big change that we had to make in, in introducing more, you know, greens and, and maybe um, making some adjustments to the things that we traditionally ate um, to, to help my dad and to help all of us. So that's where it first peaked. Um, and so I went into the University of Maryland with as a food science major, um, which because again, love food, wanted to know <laughs> all the ins and outs of it. And then, but then I realized uh, maybe junior year that I wanted to counsel on it. I wanted to learn more about the health aspects on it. And that's what dietetics is. Um, so I switched really quickly um, over, had to take like a psychology course and a couple other things during the summer, but, you know, got on track with that and, and learned that, especially in pediatrics, counseling moms, counseling children is, is where my passion lies. But again, initially just loving food, but then also just really um, being, you know, I, I guess smitten with the relationship between our nutrition and our health. And that's how it kind of all began for me. Um, I think what's most difficult uh, is when my patients felt that they weren't successful, and I say when they feel that they weren't successful, um, especially in a specialty area such as mine um, with in weight management. Um, and I also, you know, counsel bariatric surgery patients, even at the pediatric level, like our teenage patients are um, some are on the bariatric track. And so they're at a point um, in their health where we're having to intervene in this way. And they feel that they failed. They feel that they couldn't do what was asked of them by the provider, even myself, which is not often the case. Um, and so convincing them that they have been successful in making the step and being in a place where they want to change, that there are other ways to, to measure success too. It's how are you sleeping? How are your joints? How are you, you know, feeling? Look at your labs, look at your, you know, hemoglobin A1C, it's better, like different things like that. Um, but it's hard when they, they want to see something in the mirror that they're not seeing after a day or after a week and, and convincing them that this is a lifestyle change, that it's something that we have to, to keep working forward. And if our health parameters are, are better, um, then we are successful, even if they may not see that in the mirror as they, as they hope to. Um, you know, having to combat what they see on social media, you know, with all the filters that are really good these days. <laughs> so you're not sure what's real, what's not real. Um, and, and that being difficult for, for patients, all of the information that's out there around nutrition, what you should eat, what you shouldn't eat. Um, you know, what you should cut out, ketogenic diet, should I do, you know, the cayenne pepper diet? Should I? <laughs> so there's all these different things. And we're having to, to talk about what they see every day, every hour um, in our clinics when we may be only able to see them once a month um, for, for the care that we're giving. So there's definitely a lot of rewards um, that I find every day in talking to families, but combating some of those difficulties and those other influences can be pretty difficult. Thank you for sharing. Would any the panelists like to chime in there as it intersects with your work at all? Okay. All right. Hey, moving on. I, sorry. I do. I can actually relate very much to combating social media um, in practice. It's um, there's a lot of kind of newer push for kind of pelvic floor awareness, which has been great. But the downside is that it's kind of Gen it's very generalized. Um, and so there's a lot of scary language out there trying to get people to buy programs from providers. And it, you know, it's not uncommon to have somebody with something that's not that concerning come in for treatment and be absolutely panicked because of what they saw on the internet or like, oh my God, my stomach's torn apart. And it's like, no, I promise it's not. So I can totally relate to that struggle. 
I, I could echo as well what you are saying, Nora, because uh, it also happens when it comes to mental health and to couple relationships. Uh, we're consuming so much from the web. Uh, and, and really we're constantly sort of like in dialogue with what is being said and put out there. And uh, sometimes it helps and sometimes it creates another source of stress. We're comparing what we do, how we relate to each other and whether it's exactly what it's how it's supposed to be. So we're prescribing so much through the internet in terms of mental health that sometimes we end up creating, you know, uh, more stress and some mental health issues that what we are trying to uh, resolve. And uh, I could go on and on about this, but I think when it comes to, health issues, um, recipes are not the way to go. <laughs> right. And I wanted to add one more thing, because I'm interested to hear um, your thoughts on, you know, the accessibility to like healthcare and, and, you know, things like that. Definitely on the nutrition side, a huge difficulty is just um, food insecurity. And when my colleagues, like other dietitians are recommending certain things and having to be conscious of what our patients have access to, right? Um, whether it be to physicians or whatever it is, but I, I think that's been really difficult as well as that this, you know, eating pattern, of, you know, dark green leafy vegetables and lean proteins and this, that, and other um, can be very difficult <laughs> for my patients to have access to when the grocery stores aren't there or the financial, you know, support isn't there, the transportation isn't there. Uh, so I just wonder if that's also something that in your field you you notice too is just the ac access to care not being there. Totally, there's very few pelvic PTs in the world, unfortunately, more growing, but um, access to us in general is limited. Um, but then you know it's been interesting for me to see moving into Hopkins. My clinic is located at the main hospital, which is predominantly low income minority a lot of intersecting identities that really put limits on, you know, like, oh, well, let's have you buy this thing or, you know, like I, you're going to come in twice a week for every week for six weeks, right? Like you can't take off work that much. Um, whereas, you know, my first job out of physical therapy school, I was in private practice outpatient clinic at on Capitol Hill. It was a totally different pa patient population. So I absolutely have noticed, you know, having to make that switch and figure out how to, you know, get workarounds, right? Like if we can't get a purchase a $60 SI belt, like let's use a headscarf and like, how do we problem solve that um, for patients? And I think it's really nice for all three of our professions. You know, we're in the medical field in a way where we get so much time facing patients that I think we pick up on that stuff in a way that physicians don't. And that they suggest, yes, do this, do this, do this, because they have five minutes and that's all they can do. But we are the ones that are kind of like negotiating that in a different way. So absolutely. Um, yes, I, I agree with, with both what both of you have said and shared. Um, I think that um, in the in the couple and family therapy field, one of the things that we do is like, we call it contextual therapy because we're always placing the person, you know, in the context they're living with the resources they have. Mm -hmm. And um, clearly uh, we are mindful of, you know, what they can, what it can do, what is available to them, to them, et cetera. So later on, I'm gonna talk more about the program we have, but it's among other things, the relationship education program. And one of the, challenges when it comes to educating people about how to communicate, how to deal with stress and other things has been that that's absolutely useless if you don't look at other aspects of their lives. Like, you know, I can be looking at mental health, but if housing needs, you know, basic medical needs are not met, I mean, it's, you know, Maslow's priority, you know, a priority of needs, you know, basic needs have to be met and people have to be emotionally available to take care of other things uh, uh, once they take care of their basic needs. So um, so one of the, we do is like, we work with case managers so that we're constantly assessing uh, other aspects of their lives so that they can be in a place where they can attend to their relationships and their finances, et cetera. But without that case management work, I don't think we would have the success we have. And particularly with the low income 
population that we are working right now. So um, I couldn't agree with you more. Thank you for the lovely dialogue. That was great. Perfect segue, perfect discussions. Um, Ravina, do you want to ask the next question? Absolutely. I was just listening to Mariana complete her, her thoughts as it relates to what Angela and Nora said, and it really does need lead quite nicely into the next question. So in learning more about, about the work that you do and your professional engagement with your patient or client population, um, Angela, let me ask you a question. What are some of the myths that you spend time debunking with your clients around diet nutrition and lifestyle as it relates to women and, and to uh, young girls. Right, yeah. Um, so there's, there's a few. I think initially it, there's a, a thought that skinny equals healthy. <laughs> that's like one of the first ones that I have to say, nope, <laughs> that's not true. Um, they're all, you know, the a lot of conditions, diseases don't discriminate because of your body mass index, um, you know, things, how we eat and how we nourish our bodies can manifest in all sort of different ways. Um, but that, you know, that can be what they hear and what they see, um, you know, and that's part of the stigma around like obesity and weight management, or even if they're underweight or, or with an eating disorder, like you see a person of a, a certain size and there's prejudgments and there's, there's thoughts about what they are or are not doing properly to land them in that space. Um, so usually that's something that we have to talk about because I have plenty of patients um, that would be considered within a, a you know average or a body weight and and are struggling with a lot of um, comorbidities. Um, so that's one of the the myths for sure. Um, another one is just just the term diet in itself, <laughs> like that that's the way that we should go about treating um, our our you know, whatever conditions we have, but it's, it is lifestyle. It is um, changing, making changes that are sustainable, being in a place like a mental space where you can make those changes, having the, you know, environment around you, the support around you to be able to make these changes and have them be long lasting. So a diet, like we say in clinic, the D word, because it's, it's a bad word. It's, it's not something that we want to perpetuate in our, to our, our families, to our, to our young girls who are getting it again. That that's the hardest part is all of the other influences. I wish I could like take some of my patients home with me or you know something like that because they're getting it so in so many different ways that you need to eliminate carbohydrates or you need to like stop doing this or stop eating that where it's it can be a very you know inclusive eating pattern and you can still be healthy so those are, are some of the things that I'm often having to combat um, when I'm talking to the patients. Yeah, I can imagine you could spend a whole hour of your consultation just addressing those concerns and not even getting to the what you should do or what you'd like right. to see them do. You're just trying to backtrack and correct the assumptions that they came in there with. So I can imagine that that's a concept that would keep you busy for sure. Yeah. Um, Nora, let me ask you a question. Um, you mentioned briefly that, that your work specializes in pelvic health, but for those in the audience who aren't quite clear on what that means in, in clinical practice, could you elaborate on that for us? What do you mean when you say pelvic floor rehab? What does that really look like in practice? Oh, I would love to, Ravina. <laughs> um, okay, so pelvic floor has actually become a really kind of more popular buzzword type word so you may be familiar with it but like not really know what it is and like you know you're supposed to kegel because like you saw that on an article and like it's gonna make you not have to you know leak urine after you have a baby blah 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 all that um so pelvic floor is just a term that we use to talk about all of the muscles and ligaments at the bottom of the pelvis right? If you imagine a skeleton, that whole bottom of the pelvis would be wide open if we didn't have something holding all of our stuff in, right? Um, and the pelvic floor is a really unique location for many, many reasons from a physiologic perspective. Um, it has many more roles than an average muscle group does. Um, it, you know, it's involved in holding your organs in and allowing you to maintain continence. And then 
crucially, allowing you to actually evacuate your bowel and bladder contents at the right time completely. Um, and like any muscle, they can get stuck in spasm and cause pain. We can have nerve issues in the area. Any, you know, pregnancy and delivery is commonly where we think about pelvic floor going wrong, but pelvic floor is so related to so many different things, including sexual function and pelvic stability and um, you know, even high level athletes have to have really great pelvic floor function to be able to have optimal movement mechanics. Um, and so with pelvic floor dysfunction, it just means like your pelvic floor muscles are maybe not the right length, or you have some coordination dysfunction, um, or there's some sensation change, like something's not going right. Um, and you can think of it kind of like a shoulder issue, right? You didn't hurt your shoulder, but like something's been a little hinky. And so because it's such a variety of jobs, the variety of symptoms that can be a result of that are really very wide ranging. It can be sexual dysfunction. It can be, um, you know, bladder bowel related. It can be a continence issue versus an outlet issue. It can be pain. It can be back pain. Um, it can be, you know, so many things. Um, and so I think that's another speaking of myths, right? Another uh, debunking that I'm consistently having to do is that pelvic floor is just an issue for pregnant women or women who were postpartum, right? I treat a lot of men. I treat, everybody has a pelvis. Everybody can have pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and we treat, um, a fair amount of patients who are, you know, non-binary, like there's, everybody has a pelvis. And so it's not just a woman's issue. Certainly you're more likely to develop uh, pelvic floor dysfunction if you're a vagina owner, but it's not exclusive. Um, and so, you know, like thinking about assessing your bowel bladder function and sexual function and checking in with that a little bit um, is something we're not taught to do. And so symptoms can pop up and feel like they're out of nowhere, um, when we could potentially be picking up on them earlier and more importantly, getting them treated. Because another myth is that, oh, it's normal to leak urine after a baby, or it's normal to have, you know, constipation, or it's not constipation because I only, I like go every day, I have bowel movements, but I don't, I, you know, I strain, but I go every day. Um, so there's definitely a lot of room for debunking in the pelvic health world. Um, but it's, and there's a lot of, again, like carryover with bowel function and bladder function with nutrition. Um, so it's, I'm constantly referring people to dietitians. Um, so yeah, pelvic floor is a really cool area that people don't really know much about, but has really big impacts. So how do you find that most of your patients have come to you? How do they have that conversation mm -hmm. with their provider that then leads to the referral to someone like you? Yeah. So unfortunately, most people with pelvic floor dysfunction, it takes a really long time to figure out that's what the issue is, because usually for a while they think it's like, normal. Oh yeah. My mom, everybody in my mom's group has that. Or, oh yeah, my mom told me she, you know, she does this for her constipation and it just runs in the family. And so, you know, there's a certain level of like thinking it's normal and not bringing it up. And then there's also this component of it's a taboo subject. I'm a little embarrassed. I'm nervous about how somebody's going to respond. I don't know if it's normal or abnormal. And I, you know, I'm nervous about bringing it up in an appointment with my provider. And so it can take a while. And so I think, you know, some of the statistics, even on like pelvic pain are, you know, it can take a year or three, especially with the guys to get into pelvic floor PT, which is really disheartening. Um, so I think the most important thing is to make sure you have a good team, uh, your healthcare team are people who you trust and you like, and you find pretty easy to communicate. Um, communicate with and that you're comfortable sharing intimate things with primary care, OBGYN, urologist, um, anybody you're seeing. And if you're not confident that they're going to take you seriously, then maybe you want to look for somebody else and that just approach it frankly, like anybody in medicine is not afraid of a little bowel, bladder, sexual function talk. And if they are, they're not the provider for you. <laughs> get a better one. Um, and that you, I guarantee no matter what you say, it will never be the weirdest thing 
that somebody said to them. Honestly, it's probably not even the weirdest thing somebody said to them today, right? So, um, you know, we think, you know, we have a lot of emotions about these things because they're very personal, but um, it's really important to communicate them to your provider so that you get treated and you get something caught early because, yeah, it's common to leak urine after you have a baby or after menopause, but like, it's not normal and you don't have to live that way. It's not normal to have pain with sex. Like there's all kinds of things that you, you deserve better. And so speak up. Well, that's a perfect segue into my question for Mariana. Um, we're talking about the work that you do with couples. And obviously, as Nora mentioned, there's going to be some intersectionality between um, her discussion and the type of work that you do. So what is your, it looks like the concept in your, in your practice really focuses on together as, as, a, as a title for the work that you do um, and the programming that you deliver to your clients. So what does that mean? And I understand that it's interdisciplinary, but what does that mean really in practice? What does that look like for the client who comes to see you um, either with their partner or individually? What do you want them to understand? Um, so I, I need to give a little bit of context because if not, it can be a misunderstood a little bit. Um, so I mentioned earlier that um, um, my dissertation started with how uh, problems with money affected couples, couples relationships and how it affected, you know, different areas of our lives. And so um, what that's one of the main reasons why couples seek therapy. And it's one uh, of the reasons why actually couples separate. We know from research that uh, this money, uh, discussions around money take to last are the ones that last the longest in couples and they are the ones that bring about the highest level of conflict. So knowing that uh, back in 2009 and with the work I had done, I got together with a colleague that specializes specialized in financial counseling and education. And we thought together about what we could do to help couples find a way of talking about finances that actually bring them together and also help them you know, resolve their financial issues. So we, had, we were having in mind both goals, helping them improve their relationship and helping them you know, improve their finances. And so we created a program called Together that is a psychoeducational program. It's not therapy, it's not, um, a, yeah, it basically it's not individual couple therapy. It's, um, it's delivering a group setting. So people that are, couples that are interested in participating, um, they, they know that they're going to come and meet with other couples in a group format, usually around between six and eight couples, and they're going to have six meetings. The program, the workshop is like 14 hours long. And what's going to happen in that, uh, those 14 uh, hours is that they're going to learn about communication, managing stress uh, individually and together with their partner and about finances. But when they are learning about communication and when they are learning about uh, stress management, we will relate it to money. So money is a sort of like the topic from one session to the other, but all the evaluation we have done in the program shows that at all the skills they learn into um, regarding how to communicate in a healthy way, how to manage stress together when it comes to money, it can also be applied to other areas of their lives. So we are seeing changes, not just in issues related to money, but also in all other areas of their lives and stressors that are not related to money. So uh, what they can expect is like a financial counselor and a couple therapist working together every single session giving a lot of information about what are, you know, um, good uh, ways of managing stress, but also learning about how they go about it, giving them ideas about communication, but then giving them exercises to do there with us uh, online or in person. And they learn, and as they practice the exercises, you have the couple therapist and the financial counseling counselor going around and helping with all the activities they do. They also have homework in between sessions. And once they finish the six meetings after six weeks, uh, the case manager that has been assigned to them continue working with them to help them find resources in the community that they may need to resolve other issues um, and needs in, you know, in their lives. But not only their own personal lives, but also their family life. Like if they're having issues 
finding uh, some resources for their children or their parents who are going to be there helping them. So um, that's what makes it a, an interdisciplinary program. Also, that what I mentioned about uh, the finances and the emotional aspects working together. It's um, so what they can expect is also having a lot of fun because there are a lot of activities. We try to help them develop skills rather than discuss very difficult, uh, the most difficult issues they are with us. We just want them first to practice the skills so that over time, after they practice enough, they are able to uh, talk about difficult issues and help each other manage stress or plan for their finances alone. Um, so let me give you an, an example. Um, there's, there's an activity, for example, where they interview each other and they sort of get into how they develop the relationship that they have with money. What were the messages they were getting as they were growing up? How, what they saw as good examples or bad examples of how to manage money in their families, in their communities. And as they are learning about each other, what we're trying to do is helping them develop an understanding for each other's style rather than being critical. Because when it comes to money in couples, what happens is like one, each partner, as with many other things as well, with parenting and other aspects, you believe that you are right and everything would be great if your partner changed. Well, uh, that's rarely the case. Usually when we come to some sort of like resolution and way of moving forward is because we have um, left aside for a while what we believe in, in, order, in, in trying to understand really where our partner is coming from. And I think that that's what works a lot. So, um, so we do that and we do all this for free. I want to say that I'm sorry that I'm playing the ad here, but uh, we are funded. We have been funded since 2015 by the Administration of Children and Families. And it allows us to provide this service for free um, through the University of Maryland. And, and we also provide gift cards for completing service and, and all other things. But I think it's a free resource for the community. We offer it in Spanish as well. And it has been adapted for culturally also for the Latinx couples that we work with. And now we have adapted for LGBTQ uh, couples. So we're also uh, working with the LGBT community. So I'm sorry that it took so long to explain all that, but it's to give context. Well, I, I think it's fantastic that you shared all of those components because we all are connected to UMD. So to know that that's the sort of work and, and that's the sort of, not only are they giving back to the community, but you as an alumnus or alumni have the opportunity to engage with, with your alma mater in this way. And probably for a lot of us, including myself, I didn't even know that was going on there. So that's really exciting to know that that resource is there and that the university, as, as universities like to say, they want to be in your life throughout, you know, from not just when you graduate, but also for years to come. So um, as people who have the opportunity, we are relatively close to the university to be able to access that services. It's wonderful that you've shared that resource with us. So thank you very much for that. You're wonderful. Oh my gosh, I cannot believe it's 710 already. I feel like we need another two hours to continue this conversation. Um, but let's let's continue. So um, panelists, in your career field, you have seen it all, obviously from very different disciplines. Um, you've been in the front line from a clinical and professional setting, and you all have diverse perspectives that are so important to shape the future of women's health, research, and innovation. As Mariana just discussed it together, it really does take a village to empower communities and strengthen access for women. There are so many demands that to help us maintain a strong foundation and establish a healthy life cycle, which can easily be drifted off um, if we fail to explore certain areas. So there's a lot of misconceptions and there's a lot that we don't know. Um, so Nora, I wanted to ask you in, in the physical therapy world, do you encourage your patients to consider working with additional healthcare professionals when working with the public health PT? And what other conditions or treatments that women should should women consider that we maybe haven't thought about? Constantly. I can only be successful with a team. It's really rare to have somebody where there's a pelvic floor dysfunction that's really straightforward. Postpartum is a good example. Sometimes it's nice and straightforward, right? There was a, a change to the system and it's going to be pretty easy to rehab. 
otherwise, I would say, again, one of the reasons I was so excited that I was joined by these two awesome um, panelists is because these are the two professions that I refer to the most um, in my practice and having the ability to, you know, make that connection with people who are familiar with how, you know, their field impacts pelvic function is really, really helpful. Um, pelvic floor, one of the other really unique things about the pelvic floor um, physiologically is that it is in part regulated by our fight or flight response. So that like all our reflexes, our bowel bladder, sexual reflexes, it's the same system that runs our heart rate and our blood pressure and so, and our digestion. And so those are systems that when we're really stressed, or when we're having emotional turmoil, or, you know, there's, you know, just poor sleep. Um, those are things that are going to impact pelvic pain, constipation, all the symptoms that we can see at the pelvic floor. And so having that psychosocial component of treatment for, for the pelvic floor is really, really helpful and really important, um, as well as specifically couples therapy. We treat a lot of pain with sex or um, erectile dysfunction, pain with ejaculation. Um, but, you know, even for um, women, you can, there are many women who have trouble achieving orgasm or who, you know, definitely have pain with penetration, but maybe also have pain with arousal um, or persistent arousal. And so these are all things where couples therapy can be a really helpful tool because you can't have sex alone if you're with a partner, right? Like that engagement with somebody, there's somebody on the other side of that. And so we can only address the person's physical body in that engagement so much, right? It's going to, the relationship and the psychosocial state is going to be so impactful to that. And so it's really common to have a sex therapist, a talk therapist, a couples therapist um, on board with that. Um, super important. Thank you for sharing that. You're right. It's um, this is the perfect panel right here. So I, I love how we can just shift gears and all all find how everything's interconnected. So, um, Mediana, kind of staying on that topic about building healthy body, mind, how everything's interconnected. Looking at today's today's youth and providing advice for better odds in a healthy relationship. Or is there anything that you would recommend? To, for partners to sort of to start off having a healthy relationship? What do you advise today's youth to, in developing healthier uh, romantic relationships? Yes, so um, I have uh, two children, 18 and almost 21 year old girls. So um, I'm thinking all the time about what to tell them, <laughs> how to guide them. Um, I think that, um, one of the most important things is like, of course, having um, a relationship in which you feel that you are valued and you feel respected. Um, um, and, uh, and, and we can talk a lot about the definitions of respect, but I think that it's important that we feel appreciated, that we feel seen and that we feel safe. That's sort of like a number one issue, safety. Uh, if there is something that's sort of telling you that you don't feel safe, and I'm not referring only to um, issues of physical safety, of course, those should come first, uh, but I'm also referring to psychological safety. You know, if you feel that you're being constantly put down, or if you feel that you're not appreciated, or, you know, if you feel that you're being controlled, or, you know, or there's any anything that makes you feel that that's not a safe place um that safety is it's um a, a, a key component to develop intimate relationships and i think that couple relationships healthy couple relationships are about our uh, the possibilities of having intimacy with uh, another person and developing intimate relationships um is tremendously important for our mental health and uh, for again for what I was saying earlier to be able to have a space um, have someone a relationship where we can be ourselves where we can feel safe um, I think um, coming from a different culture I think that the way we live in general in Oswina societies but here in particular 
sometimes um, feeling that we can be ourselves in our relation in a relationship that can be challenging. So if there's one relationship where we need to feel safe in addition to relationship with perhaps caregivers is also um, the person we choose or we want to partner with romantically. So I would say for youth that if they uh, sense that that's not the case, that they don't feel safe, they're not feeling appreciated or valued, I would say that that's already a very red flag that should they should pay attention to. Uh, because things can be worked out, you can work through a lot of challenges, but the safety, the commitment, the caring, the feeling valued and appreciated are super important. And of course, I would say communication. Uh, we read about that everywhere, but our ability, uh, because all relationships sooner or later will face challenges, that's inevitable. And um, some challenges are typical of the developmental cycle of a relationship. Some others are unexpected. And we're living through very challenging times. So if we don't have an ability to um, repair and come back after differences, after difficult moments, that's a problem. Avoidance is not a solution. And being at each other's throats is not, is not a solution long term. You don't, they, you don't want the relationship to become a place where you get hurt deeply and badly. You don't want to be wounded constantly. Um, that's, uh, I would say that that's very, very important. And, uh, and I would say commitment, which is very challenging these days as well. Um, and whatever um, commitment, and I would say, and loyalty, uh, that doesn't mean necessary sexual exclusivity, but it does need some kind of agreements um, in terms of what to expect from each other, what to expect in the relationship, and then really respecting uh, those expectations and that commitment. I think those are uh, things that are very, very important. And that um, is not a relationship, it's not about only one's needs, about the other person's needs and uh, being in touch with what one needs, but also uh, being in touch, I mean, being able to observe the other person and try to understand the other person rather than to impose one's perspective. I could go on and on and on, but I think that uh, uh, if I'm talking to a woman, probably and this is a generalization, but I would emphasize really looking at the um, or paying attention to one's needs. If I'm talking to a man in general, I try to go in the opposite direction. Uh, this is not a biological thing. I think it's really a social socialization issue. And I know that I'm, ma I'm making generalizations here, but um, I think that in relationships, um, many times women have to really pay attention to their own needs, to their own spaces. Uh, because many times we are willing, too much willing to be there for the other. And, uh, and that's something to keep an eye on because at the end of the day, that's not good for them. It's not good for the relationship. And, and you talk about youth, but long-term is not good in terms of what we role model for our um, girls, <laughs> for our children, and what we teach, you know, everyone about what the relationships are about. If, if we teach them, it's about one giving up everything and the other one, you know, just enjoying that and being in touch with needs, that's not a good, a good model, you know, because both people have needs and need for spaces as well, personal space. So, yeah. I can echo off of that too, that um, the women, in my experience, have a really hard time centering themselves in a in their life and have a really hard time prioritizing their health care um, in a way that um, I feel like is adequate sometimes. And you know, I think there's a lot of societal pressure. It's definitely um, a socialization thing, but you know, well, my kids come first and like absolutely, but also you got to treat your own health care and carve out time in your day for you and to prioritize your health care the same way that you would the other people that you love in your life. And so I definitely, I see that as well in my field. Yeah, I have to jump into because 
because it's a, it's like the same thing across the the spectrum. I think I'm always telling um, the women, usually moms, um, in a pediatric practice, you have to take care of yourself first. Even it's not selfish. It's not you know um, a bad thing to put yourself first so you can be available for your children, for your family, so that you you need to be a role model too for the young girls or your your children, so that they make healthy choices for themselves. They know you know to eat regularly. They know to to choose what's best for nourishing their body so they can grow and thrive. But it's a constant conversation that I'm having that I have like moms who won't eat. They'll like scurry and, you know, and make the prepare this great meal for everyone else, clean the kitchen, you know, put the babies to bed. And then they're like, oh, I, you know, I didn't eat <laughs> you know, dinner or I skipped, you know, and, and becomes really difficult. And then I see them for all the deficiencies and, you know, their nutrients and things like that. I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> you weren't taking care of yourself. Um, so it, uh, gosh, it definitely is something that I see all the time. Um, and so I feel, I, I knew that it wasn't just isolated to nutrition, of course, but it, to hear from the two of you is that you're echoing that same message is really um, reassuring for me. That's excellent. And I, I think um, what is also nice to hear from your fellow uh, panelists is, is the confirmation and the, um, the affirmation that what you're doing every day, it doesn't just matter for the work that you do, but it matters for the other professionals who are also guiding these patients and also trying to deliver you know, their best information, their best data um, to, to facilitate you know, a, a better life experience for the patients or the clients that they see every day. And so I work in healthcare as well. So it is lovely when you can hear other people echo something and you think, I'm on the right track. So it's wonderful that you all have had the opportunity to share your thoughts and to get that, that kind of group think going. Um, Angela, you mentioned this earlier about social media and the impact it has had on uh, some of your patients, but I just wanted to revisit one section of that that we didn't quite touch on yet, and that's the issue of eating disorders um, and that there's been a significant challenge with eating disorders in young females and especially post-pandemic, we've seen a lot of discussion about that. So has your practice changed in any way or how you approach your patients to, to address that or to challenge that experience that you're seeing lately? Yeah, and we definitely, unfortunately, saw like a huge um, increase in our admissions in patient um, for, for patients that were suffering from eating disorders. Uh, so it's unfortunate, but we know like the isolation of the pandemic, being, you know, <laughs> just on their screens, that was the only kind of socializing that um, the teens were doing or adolescents were doing. So it was easy to get caught up in, in a very tough space um, mentally and, and not make the best choices for ourselves and, and get stuck. Um, so the pandemic also forced us to do a lot more telehealth, which is great, <laughs> and increasing our accessibility to our patients. That was a huge thing that we're still doing very much now. We didn't you know, totally disband with um, virtual, you know, uh, counseling with our dietitians. Again, multidisciplinary. So our dietitians, psychologists, psychiatrists, uh, medical professionals, social work, case management. We have all of them part of the the team for our patients. And so we are we're definitely trying to find ways to Zoom with, with our patients, our teens on their phone directly. You know, their parents will need to be there too if they're under 18, of course. But how we can be there more often in a way that they're, they're always on their phone anyway. <laughs> so let's, you know, be part of that um, for them. So that was something that we had to change pretty quickly because we had to <laughs> as a result of the pandemic. But we noticed that especially our adolescent and teen patients were, you know, liked it. They liked being able to, to not have to come into a clinical setting. Um, you know, they often have like white coat syndrome where they don't, they're just nervous or don't want to open up or have a conversation as much about their eating habits or about what they're, what's going on with body image and having all those conversations when they're in a clinical setting. But if we're on their phone or on their, you know, computer, it's a little bit more um, casual. <laughs> uh, so we're, we noticed that that worked pretty well. Um, I think another thing that we had to do too, and it's it's unfortunate, um, in healthcare, we, we're just at a shortage of a lot of providers. Um, a lot of, you know, uh, a lot of our nurses, dietitians, a lot of um, psychologists, we just don't have as many a lot left or pivoted, and we just haven't been able to get our 
are staffing up as much. Um, so even though we want to have more touch points with our patients, which we're trying to do and, and fill in the gaps with like telehealth, that's been a little difficult, but we did notice when we weren't too bad with our staffing that if we're able to see our patients more often, we were extending our hours into the evening, after school, you know, during lunch, trying to, to make ourselves more available for the patients and, and being more empathetic and, and, you know, using the things that they're comfortable with. If we, we with social media and things like that, uh, to, to help them and to, to have them understand that there's a better way to go about, you know, their eating and, and their lifestyle um, and support from the community as well, because we have a shortage of, you know, maybe psychologists, we're definitely working with, um, you know, different providers in the community, at other hospitals. I think there, I felt that there was always some like unspoken competition between hospital systems, like in wanting to have the patients and not really share them or not want to collaborate as much, but we're having to do that as well um, to make sure that the patients are getting seen by whomever they need to, even if it's not a children's national. So there, you're finding a lot more collaboration, which is a, a happy um, accident yeah. of, of what, what has happened in, in recent times. Nora, let me ask you, as it relates to pelvic health, from the time that you first started working in this area um, to where you are now professionally and what you see happening in the field, can you share with us some of the insight uh, of what you've seen as far as what's, what has been the transition and how people address pelvic health and what are you seeing personally and the work that you do uh, on a daily basis as far as that evolution? Yeah, um, the field, public health field from a physical therapy perspective is fairly new. Um, and so it's still in these like really cool early transition phase, right? Um, you know, like the Academy of Public Health Physical Therapy was established in the 80s, which is when I was established. <laughs> so um, it, you know, it's still in its early years. And so one of the cool things about that is that we're learning so much so fast and that data is changing fast. Like for example, Kegels can be bad for you. There are some people, there are many people who Kegels are not only not the right treatment, but they can cause further symptom or symptom progression. Um, and so like 10 years ago, we weren't quite clear on that. Um, so there's a lot that's changing from like the clinical perspective. Um, I would say there's a lot changing in terms of awareness, right? We talked about awareness overall in society. It's becoming more of a buzzword in, in the world. Still really kind of focused to that, you know, just postpartum and just pregnancy section versus postmenopausal or, you know, constipation with girls who have eating disorders. And so they're having functional constipation that leads to outlet constipation, which can be a pelvic floor dysfunction. Um, and so it's really spans realizing how it spans that lifespan and trying to deliver that information um, to the public. And honestly, there's a lot of physicians out there who have no idea what we do. <laughs> Um, and so starting to get that awareness out, roll the ball out for that a little bit more, um, you know, again, with that mindset, a lot of them have that mindset that pelvic floor physical therapy is for people who's I've, literally, it's a direct quote. Um, oh, that's for people whose bladders are falling out. Um, and so like the, it, we're still in that shift and there's still certainly a long way to go. Um, especially as you know, pelvic health and women's health and physical therapy are kind of intertwined as a kind of specialty still at this point. Um, and, you know, women's health includes breast cancer and breast cancer rehab and lymphedema and osteoporosis and balance later in life. And, um, you know, in adolescence, the athletic triad where we're having that hormonal imbalance from not enough nutrition versus the out flow of energy. And so it really kind of starting to zoom out in terms of women's health, um, clinically and socially and awareness wise. 
That's excellent, excellent. Okay, Mariana, I'd like to ask you, and you touched on this briefly um, a moment ago when you were discussing that, just clarifying for us what it means for your the work you do um, and together, but can we just get a further um, delineation from you as far as the work you do with couples when people come to you um, as a couple, as a part of a couple versus as an individual, um, do you guide, if a person comes to you as an individual, do you guide them that you that you want this to be more collaborative with their partner? Do you accept people if they come in as individuals? How do you approach that topic? Okay. So um, in the Together program and the version in Spanish is called Juntos en Pareja, we, uh, we see only couples. So people already come as a couple. And so it's a requirement to participate. So there's not a lot of explanation, but uh, as a couple therapist and also, um, you know, faculty and supervisor and director of a couple and family therapy program and th a couple therapies myself, um, we really emphasize working with relationships in the session versus with individual because there are some topics where people come and they're just concerned themselves. But for most men, most of the times it concerns relationship with friends, relationship with uh, family members, relationship with children, but definitely most of the time relationships with partners. And um, we always want to have the, the other perspective on the story. What's going on? What is the experience of the other person involved in this situation? When you're working with just one individual, you just work with that version, that experience of what's going on. And, and sometimes that's all you have and there's no possibility of involving the other person because they refuse to come to therapy. But whenever there is a chance of involving the other person that uh, is part of the issues, part of the conflict, you do a lot of more work. It's faster and it's more durable, um, permanent over time. The, the kind of change that you can make is completely different. The other thing is that when you're working individually with on a relationship issue, uh, there are a lot of risks about doing that. Um, one is that you're working with just one perspective. So you run the risk of reaffirming that perspective and limiting the possibilities of change for the person. And what we know is that in relationships, most of the change happens because you are helping two people trying to really understand each other not trying to uh, impose one's sense of reality and what's happening, one's perception over the other. If you do that, something has no work. That never works. So uh, a professional, a couple therapist has been trained specially to be able to have a conversation, um, as, have a space where one person can have a better sense, come closer to what happens to the other person. It's never... I mean, the story that all couple therapists will tell you is like, you start with two people that believe that the problem is the other person, that only if the other person changed, everything would be perfect. And the, if you go in that direction, nothing will change. And that's the risk of sometimes the, the sort of like a confirmation of your own reality that you get in individual therapy. Inevitably so, because you're only working with one partner. But when you have both in the room, um, you really forced to uh, be challenging your own perception of reality and deal with the experience of the other person. And, um, and there's a lot of beauty. I feel that that work is very challenging and it's not about being neutral. It's not about being a judge. It's not about deciding who's right or who's wrong. It's really the ability to experience you know, reality and uh, things that happen from each partner's perspective and help each partner do, do the same thing to some extent with them and then find a place where they feel safe. Another thing that I would like to clarify, there's there are different approaches to work with couple therapy in couple therapy, but there's one where there's a firm belief that the emotions that we come up with are um, in a session, which could be anger, frustration, um, disappointment, all these things really are hiding more primary emotions that are related to basic needs, such as to feel loved, fear of abandonment, or other things that are more um, basic for our survival 
but that we hide, you know, underneath a lot of mechanisms to show that we are stronger, that we don't need the other person, or that we can be stronger than the other person, or that the other person is there to satisfy our needs, when deep down what we want is like to feel appreciated, to feel loved, to feel seen, to be seen, you know, all those kinds of things. And I think that that can happen in the context of couple therapy, non-individual therapy. You don't have the other person there. I hope I have convinced you to come to couple therapy, but uh, uh, it's so important that sometimes we also um, try to get to talk to the other partner if they are reluctant to come and say, why don't you come for a couple of sessions or just at least once, because we want to hear your, your side of the story. We want to hear what you have to say. And we're not here to convince you that you should do what the other partner wants. We're here just to develop understanding. So, yeah. That's excellent. Well, ladies, you all have each provided some really profound insight into the experience of womanhood across the life cycle, and really that not just women, but that engagement in, in society between men and women and non-binary people and how we as humans interact and move through this thing called life. So obviously we could have a discussion that went on for hours. Um, you all are all very engaging women and you have insight that is is worth sharing, but we wanted to give each of you an opportunity as we close out the evening to just share maybe two or three snippets that you would share with a young woman, a middle-aged woman, a woman who is approaching um, the, the, the last, I guess, um, quarter of their life cycle, whatever that would be. You know, those three stages of, of the progress in, in the life cycle, how you would approach each of those populations and just share a little bit of insight that you would um, that you would share with those women, um, you know, as, as they continue to think about the particular areas that you specialize in. So for you, Angela, nutrition, um, and for you, Mariana, how would you, you would guide them you would have some great insight as it relates to um, the psychology and, and embracing the aging experience and moving into that last phase. And obviously for you, Nora, as you talk about um, pelvic health and, and moving through that progression from the young woman to the middle-aged woman to the woman who's now looking at menopause and how that might affect her experience um, and how she thinks about her pelvic health. If each of you could share a little insight and Angela, I'll start with you um, and we'll just move forward from there yeah so I think what I would say to I'm just gonna say a younger me <laughs> um, would be to be engaged in your health to ask questions of your parents of your health care providers um, to be curious about what it is that you're putting in your bodies um, that can impact your health that can impact you know how you move, how even in your social um, situations, but to ask those questions and be curious. Um, and social media, try, <laughs> I always would say, try to, you know, be, you know, tactful, smart about that. I know it's, it's social, it's, it's not going away, I don't believe, but I think it's just surrounding yourself with good friends, good fam good people around you, your family, and having that support system when you're, you're younger. Um, as we mentioned before, probably the middle-aged woman is just not putting themselves first. So that would be my, uh, you know, advice is to believe that your nutrition is just as important as that of your partner, that of your children, that of your mom, your sister, your friends, that, that you also are important and, and making sure that you, um, you know, do what you need to do, nourish your body to, to, if you're the younger self that was engaged and asked all the questions, <laughs> then you're able to put those things into practice when you're a little older and, and making sure that you're doing what you need to to stick around for all the people that, that rely on you. And then um, for uh, older adult um, women, I think, I guess I'm like talking to my mom, <laughs> I would tell her that it's it's still important to, to eat well, um, I think, you know, my mom would often say like that things are done just for, for having children or when you're young or, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. I'm old or whatever. And it does still matter. Um, so, you know, especially if you're at menopause, 
postmenopausal, postmenopausal. We're looking at calcium and vitamin D levels. We're looking at, you know, um, you know, the integrity of your skin and what the protein we're taking in and just all sorts of things. It doesn't go away. So I, I think that that's the advice I would give to a, a older um, woman is just that it still matters for you too, <laughs> what you're doing and, and how you're navigating your eating habits and your nutrition. Excellent. And Nora, what would you say? What would be your advice um, th through those three cycles? Yeah, I think for a, a younger woman, you know, I think one of the main reasons that we catch stuff later than we should when it comes to pelvic health um, and when it comes to pelvic cancers and urinary tract infections and all of these things that are more nefarious than just run of the mill pelvic floor dysfunction is that kind of stigma and that kind of dissociation almost um, of, from ourselves, from this area in our body and feeling shame or um, uncomfortableness around knowing what that area looks like. And, you know, you can get skin cancer there. And so same way we do breast checks, we should be doing vulva checks and, um, you know, being comfortable with that area of your body and paying attention to what feels different. And if something changes, feeling confident talking about that with um, your parents or later on with your, you know, family or friends, um, and really ultimately with your, your medical providers. So we're catching these things early. So they're not developing into, you know, more complicated things and we're making sure we're screening things out effectively. I think that middle age, I mean, it's, you know, from a pelvic health perspective, that middle age of life is where for many, um, many women, pelvic floor goes through a whole heck of a lot. Um, a lot of women have kids, a lot of women, um, have symptoms in pregnancy, you know, one in two to one in three women will have symptoms of prolapse after pregnancy, regardless of delivery style. Um, and so knowing that your pelvic floor is going through big changes, you're, you're starting to hit this, like you're not quite so young anymore, a time in your life, there's more stress sometimes, uh, you know, as you settle into, you know, whatever your life is going to look like with or without kids. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's important to check in with your pelvic floor and to take pelvic floor health seriously. Um, you know, it's not normal to you leak urine. It's not normal to have constipation. It's not normal to have pain with sex or, or pelvic pain. Um, and, you know, getting that addressed adequately. And then in that older adult range, urinary and bowel incontinence is the number one reason why older adults get transitioned into nursing homes. And so this is an area where, it, again, it's not normal, um, but it is common. And so how do we get ahead of that and treat that and look out for that um, from a just even just quality of life perspective as we get older, as well as all these things um, postmenopausally that change, you know, risk for falls um, our, as our estrogen decreases, our, our lower extremity strength can reduce and our muscle mass changes and all these things with, you know, our bone density. And there's really good data to show that physical activity, especially guided by a professional, whether it's a personal trainer who's skilled in that population or a physical therapist or a group setting that, that you can treat that you can minimize that and you can build muscle until your dying day. And you can build bone mass and maintain bone mass um, and really increase not just your quality of life, but also your length of life. Okay. Excellent. Mariana? Um, I think that in a way, when we think about um, the psychology of women, we could be thinking the same way as Nora and Angela described, that the, the, the more you take care of yourself in, you know, at the very beginning when you're younger, you know, the the better outcomes you will have along the way. So I would start by saying, again, I told you that I have a, this is like talking to my daughter, my uh, almost 21 year old daughter. And uh, it's really, what I would tell her is like, really make sure that um, you build a very strong self-esteem, uh, that you believe in yourself, that you look around for very good role model of women that, um, you you think that can um, uh, that can help you you know think about yourself and what you want. Listen not only to what others 
say that you should be or you should be doing, but also listen to yourself, to your voice, discover your voice, get in touch with that. Um, don't jump so quickly into what you should do on what uh, has been prescribed in society that women should do, but actually uh, find your own path and take your time to find that path. Uh, I think that younger women are doing a better job than we did 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, or even 50, definitely 50 years ago. I think that they are way stronger. I think that the Me Too movement, among other things, is playing a very big role in shaping how uh, women are finding their voices and um, and they and their voices are stronger and they're making sure that they're being heard. So in all areas, in their relationships, at work, in different ways. So um, I would say that um, and start forming strong relationship with other women because those understand very well um, your reality. And they may not understand all aspects of your reality, but definitely some aspects of your reality. So different, uh, different uh, friendships, different women uh, groups um, help. Then as uh, they get into the age where they are dealing with um, also taking care of kids, if they have kids and, uh, and kids getting older, um, I think the women we have there, the highest risk of getting lost. Uh, I and Nora and Angela have talked about how, um, you know, mothers bring their children and they don't take care of their own health. You know, we, we start getting into the habit of putting ourselves back on the list of people that need to be taken care of. And um, I think that that's, uh, we all know by now that that's never good. Um, so um, how it, it's really a challenge of how to carve out space for us, for our health, for um, self-care, uh, for rejuvenation, uh, for also, um, you know, being able to relax. And uh, sometimes that can be with others, sometimes that can be by ourselves, because um, we cannot be there for others if we are not there for ourselves first. Um, and again, I keep saying, one day my daughter said, mom, you're the worst role model. I don't want to have your life. And I remember hearing that and like, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to excel in everything. How is she telling me this? And, and what she was telling me is like, you're killing yourself to excel in everything as a mom, as a professional, as a wife, as a friend. This is, I mean, this is too much. If life is so many demands on ourselves as women, I don't want, I don't want to be you. I want to be a different woman. And as painful as it was, I think that um, that's a moment where we really have to take care of ourselves to to, to, to really think about what we're projecting and we're really are living, you know, healthy and balanced lives um, without sacrificing ourselves all the time for everything. We are the last ones to sit, to have, uh, to eat at dinner. We are the last ones to have the shower in the home. We are the last ones to go and buy clothes for ourselves, to have doctor's appointments. And, and then that carries on to our, you know, later stages of life. We are the ones taking care of family members and the caregivers and uh, of elderly family members and uh, or even you know sisters and uh, brothers etc. We're always there for for others. So I think if we have done a good job before <laughs> of taking more care of ourselves, perhaps we reach that age with a more balanced uh, life. And I think that uh, I would say across all ages, life is also for us, not only for others. And uh, and and I know that we enjoy relationships and that's what we do it that's why we do it but I I think that we also feel bad when we realize uh, at a later stage in life that life has gone by and we have not been there for ourselves so the commitment is should also be with ourselves I don't think we could have asked for a better conclusion for this evening um and the fact that it, this was around women's history month just that's the icing on the cake so thank you ladies you've done a fantastic job of elucidating um the thoughts and, and the um the importance of the work that you do every day and especially your representation of umd and what that experience has taught you and how you've carried it forward so phenomenal thank you to each and every one of you thank Tina, you very much. 
I think that you said that you close this out nicely, Ravina. I think this was such a lovely perspective. Um, we did get one question from the audience that I think just ties into um, the self-care component that you talked about, Mariana, and just looking internally at what's important for us women to do for ourselves. So I just wanted to get one, one, um, one minute each of you. Um, just really, what's your favorite part of your day in your career? What's, why is this most important to you? What, what fulfillment does this bring for you as an individual? Angela? Uh, so I would say, I mean, for me, not only, the, I was going to say talking about food, but I already said that. So I would say it's learning from my patients, from my families. I love to hear their stories. I love to hear their backgrounds. You know, I think this area in DC, the metropolitan area, is such a melting pot. So I've, I've talked to families from all over the world, which is so cool to hear how they eat and what their customs are and what foods that they bring and how they prepare it, what their family dynamics are. Um, so I think that's always a highlight is when they talk to me about their backgrounds, even more so than me giving the recommendations. Um, so I think that that's always really fun for me to, to learn. I've tried so many different foods just from what my patients have said they eat. And I'm just curious. So I think that that is really cool. We're able to bond on that. And they know that I'm getting something out of the visit, just like I hope they're getting something from me out of the visit. Thank you. Nora? I, the, the limitations and the emotional component of having something going wrong with bowel, bladder, or sexual function, or having genital pain, it impacts your day unlike anything else in physical therapy, in my opinion. Um, it is so foundational to human function. And so to be able to work with people and be able to kind of use some intersections of, um, you know, the a little psychology, a little nutrition, a little, just the little that I know of each of those to get us started on a path um, and to be able to support them through a really rough, scary time um, to the point that we resolve the issue and they're able to do these things again. And, you know, I don't know where the taboo line is anymore because I'm a pelvic health PT, but you know, one of my favorite things is somebody comes in and they come in, they come swing the door open. And they're like, I had sex and it was great. And you're like, amazing. So I think, you know, it's a really fun field. We don't have any taboos in our office. The nothing is weird. Nothing is gross. It's all just human life and human function and making sure that, you know, you're living your best life from a pelvic perspective. And so I just find that so uh, rewarding and, and really um, lovely to share with my patients. Thank you so much. And Mariana. So, um, well, of course I enjoy when uh, couples and uh, say that they have enjoyed the program or that they got a lot out of, uh, you know, a session and feeling that I can make a difference. But I, I was thinking because my day, because I teach, I do research, I interact with so many people during the day. And I, and I was thinking of the common thread. And I think that, uh, I really enjoy when we're, when, I enjoy when working with people uh, and uh, and when we, all of us in what we are doing, I feel that we have found some, that we have found meaning, that we find that what we're doing is meaningful, whatever that takes. I, I feel that that's so powerful. Uh, these are such difficult times, uh, so much uncertainty, so many threads that we can connect and find meaning in what we do. Um, and I see that others also experience the same thing. Like today I had a meeting with all the staff of the Together program and we were thinking about how to make improvements and everybody was uh, sort of like adding to the creative uh, process. Um, for me, that was a moment of joy because it was like, uh, we're, all, we're all here together beyond the payment. I mean, we are here because we are together trying to do this and in doing this uh, make we give meaning to our lives, to our professions, to what we do. So um, sorry, I was so abstract, but I was thinking that that's a sort of thread across everything I do. Thank you. No, that was beautiful. Thank you, all of our panelists. Thank you, my colleague, Ravina, for this wonderful moderation. Um, this was such an amazing session, really couldn't have been another better way to close out Women's History Month. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to pass it off to our president, Jameson, to close us out. Uh, Cassie has a few words. Yep, go ahead. Cassie, please. Yeah, thank you.
Um, uh, thank you, Jameson, and good evening, everyone. Thank you to Jameson and the School of Public Health alumni, to the moderators, and to the panelists and audience for this awesome conversation. My name is Cassie Adjimandua. I'm an alumna of the University of Maryland's Clark School of Engineering, currently working as a senior, senior solutions architect with Amazon. I'm also the current president of the University of Maryland Black Alumni Network, and I have several board members, um, several of my board members on this call as well. Uh, the University of Maryland's Black Alumni Network was founded in 1958, so this year we're celebrating 65 years, and our goals are to promote and facilitate Black alumni involvement with the university, support alumni, current students, and the greater community through events, service, and giving, create a pipeline for Black graduating students to become active members of the Alumni Association, and promote the overall messaging of the University of Maryland's Alumni Association. We do programming throughout the year, and coming up, we have a few um, events. We have a uh, community service event during the University of Maryland's Do Good Month. We will be helping the University of Maryland's Community Learning Garden as they prepare to grow food for the UMD Campus Pantry on April 8th and April 15th at 10 a.m. On April 22nd, we will be co-sponsoring the annual Gift of Giving Gala with the Student Success Leadership Council. The Gift of Giving Gala is a Black Tie Scholarship and Awards Gala, which celebrates the outstanding achievements of Black alumni, students, faculty, and staff. We will also be giving away scholarships to several current and incoming students through the Student Success Service Leadership Scholarship. And on June 19th, for Juneteenth and Sickle Cell Awareness Day, we will be hosting our second in-person blood drive with the Red Cross on campus at the Nambru Cultural Center. While our programming is targeted towards the Black community, everyone is welcome to attend, participate, and support. And I'll be posting the links for all of these events in the chat. Thank you again to the School of Public Health alumni for this great co-sponsorship and Women's, Women's History Month event. Awesome, thank you so much, Cassie. Um, thank you all for attending the second event in our Terrapin Perspective series, Women's Health, A Full Life Cycle. Uh, wow, what an incredible discussion. Uh, really a pleasure to be with you all this evening. Um, so lovely to learn more about each of our panelists and especially to see our fabulous moderators, Tina and Ravina shine in their first time hosting for the School of Public Health Alumni Network. It will not be their last. Um, as I said before earlier, um, we couldn't put on events like this without your generosity and expertise. Um, special thank you to the University of Maryland Black Alumni Network for their help in promoting this event. Um, and Angela, so happy to, to have you on um, the second time around for our, for our second event. Um, but in the next 24 hours, all registrants will receive a list of resources compiled with the help of our panelists related to women's health. Um, and yeah, thank you all for your commitment to sharing information about women's health for the School of Public Health Alumni community. Uh, we hope you will join us for similar programming in the near future. Please visit the School of Public Health website for more information about upcoming events. If you have feedback about tonight's event that you'd like to share with me directly, please email me at um, jamesonroth at gmail.com. I'm gonna put it in the chat. Uh, but thank you all for, um, for attending and, and we hope you'll join us again soon. Have a great evening. Thank you.